don't just stand to your feet. We'll look at the scripture together. By the way, we don't collect the offering here. You can be generous on your way out. You can do a check or cash. Or There's a bunch of different ways. You can do it online at myhc.church. Uh, you can do it through the phone app, and you can text it to 84321. And it all works. Say amen if you're ready. All right. This is going to be a good one today, I think. I think. John chapter 21. We're talking about discipleship. We're, we're talking about shaping. The technical word for shaping in the church world is called discipleship. Jesus made disciples. He called us to make disciples. So disciples literally means followers. So we're, we're talking about shaping people into committed followers of Christ. So that's, where we're, that's the theme of uh, the vision series in September. So we're going to look at John chapter 21. We're starting verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into a boat. But that night they called nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. Stop rubbing it in. I put, I put that in there. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other, other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning, a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This is how the, this is now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because he had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Father, we thank you today for your goodness to us. We pray, Lord, that we'd be a church that could shape people to follow you. That because we were together, Lord, that we'd look like you more. Lord, we pray that we would lean into the calling you've put on our lives to do this. And we pray because we obeyed you, there'd be more people following you than there was when we started. Thank you for the opportunity. Renew our minds today through your word. In Christ's name we pray. Everyone said amen and amen. You may be seated. We're talking about shaping people in the committed servants this month. And, and I told you before the technical word for that in church world is discipleship. And um, we, we uh, in modern day church, we have um, strived to be efficient. I actually talked to our staff that we can be efficient in systems, but inefficient with people. And what that means is 
in, in the private sector in a business, you would want to do the most work with the least amount of people. Amen? That's where you make profit. The most work with the least amount of people. In church world, you want to do the most work with the, most, the, with the largest amount of people. Amen? You want to get everybody following Jesus. You don't want to ever look at anybody and go, hey, we got enough. We got enough. Keep the profit margins right. We don't need any more people coming in here messing it up. No, you, you want to be inefficient with people. You want to use more people than somebody else typically would. Hey, if it takes five people to do that, let's use 15 people to do that because we can include more people. So we're efficient with systems, inefficient with people. What God has called us to do is he's called us to make disciples of Christ. And so in our modern day church world, we've missed the idea of, of what that means. We've turned it into like classwork. So, so we turn it into a four week course on how to, how to be a Jesus follower. And, and you sign up for the four-week course, and, and when you're done the four-week course, you get your certificate that you're now a follower of Jesus. And then a week later, having known that we covered sex, drugs, and rock and roll in the four-week course, only to look at your Instagram feed the next week and realize that you're doing all three of those things in the same weekend, after you've taken the Jesus follower course. So then... In response to that, somebody calls the pastor and says, now they can't serve on the greeting team anymore. But they have a certificate that says they're Jesus followers. The reality is, is there was no course on following Jesus when Jesus was around. The reality is, is that you live life together. My friend Evans just told you he wanted the, the African saying is that if you want to know how somebody operates, you go live with them. You go, you go figure it out. I'm not inviting all of you to my house. <laughs> Don't misinterpret that. But it is true in the sense of teaching people how to follow Christ. When Christ had any option he wanted, he chose to live with people. He chose to do life with people. He chose to hang out with people. And so the, the, the disciples all got a multi-year master's course on following Christ. And at the end of it, they all failed the exam. Shocking. How they, could, how they could walk in the very footsteps, eat the same food, listen to the same things, watch him heal people, watch him do the miraculous, watch him raise Lazarus from the dead, watch him, watch him feed thousands of people. And yet at the end, when it all came down to the final, they flunk it. And, 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 and we think at times, if we could get people through this discipleship course, if, we, if modern day church, if we get them four weeks in this class and four weeks in this class and we get them a certificate, then they'll be good. And the reality is, is shaping people takes a lot more time and effort than that. Amen. I have kids over the age of 18 years old now. And I'm not done. I'm thinking, what's the cutoff point, Lord? How responsible do I have to still be? It's a lifetime of shaping. It's a lifetime of shaping. So we look in this passage of scripture, we see... Um, Beautiful thing happening. First of all, Jesus has died, resurrected. And the Bible says that we've talked about this before, that he had shown himself with many convincing proofs over the period of about 40 days. We find out from John, this is, this is the third time that Jesus reveals himself to the disciples. Now, what you have to remember is, these are the guys that had followed him day and night, slept in the same, air, in the same places, ate the same food did the same things. He's sent them out before and they've healed the sick and cast out demons and they've come back shocked at the power he entrusted them with. They have been with him, but they all scattered when he was arrested. And they all scattered and then Peter took it a step farther. In the courtyard, Peter denies even knowing Jesus. He didn't just run off, he runs off follows from a distance, and when Jesus is being tried, 
Peter is in the courtyard, but the Bible says within eye shot of Jesus that they, can, they could see each other. So some of you know the story. Jesus had predicted this before he was arrested and said, you'll deny me. And Peter said, there's no way I'll deny you. I'll, I'll go to my deathbed and I won't deny you. And here Peter is standing around a fire. First person walks up to him and says, hey, aren't you? Yeah, I recognize you. Aren't you? You're with Jesus. I don't know what you're talking about. It's not me. Second, I, I'm pretty confident I've seen you before with him. Nope, not me. Third time, the Bible says he calls down a curse. The strongest terms, I don't know if he used the F word, but he, the strongest terms he could use. I don't know him. And the Bible says that the rooster crowed, the, the sign that Jesus told him uh, before all this happened, before the cock crows, you're gonna do it. No, not me. Then Peter hears it. He looks at Jesus and makes eye contact and his whole world is shattered in that moment. It's tough to recover from something like that, isn't it? So we know Jesus has revealed himself twice to the disciples by walking through a locked door. And now we're coming to a place where they've gone back to fish. I think it's curious that the Bible includes that Peter just looked at the other disciples and said, I'm going to go fishing. I'm not sure if following Jesus around for three years would make you unsatisfied with fishing, but I think it would have made me unsatisfied with fishing. So you can imagine Peter at the point, confused, hurt, disappointed in himself, not sure of what's next. He decides, I'm gonna go fishing. That's what I know how to do. The rest of the disciples go, sounds good to me. So they spend the whole night fishing. They spend the whole night fishing and catch nothing. Now, I know there's some people here, I know there's some people here that claim that a bad day of fishing is still a better day, uh, better than a day at work. And you're sick. <laughs> it's weird. I don't wanna sit out on a boat and not accomplish what I sat on the boat to do. Anybody else? If I went to fish, then I want to catch fish. If I don't catch fish, I'm a failure. Nobody else thinks like that? How was your day? It was terrible. What'd you do? I went fishing, caught nothing. Yeah, but you weren't at work. That's not the point. I failed at fishing. So you can imagine this was like, like icing on the cake for Peter on the on the moldy cake for Peter. All this crazy stuff has transpired. There is no guarantee of their future. There's no guarantee of what they can expect. And they go out to do the one thing that they know how to do and they fail at it. They're pulling the boat in. They're about a hundred yards offshore. And they hear this. Hey, you guys got any fish? Now, if that were you and me, you probably would have waved back to him, not with your whole hand, but with just a segment of your hand. No, we don't have any fish. I think it's crazy that Jesus asked him if they had any fish. You got any fish? No. Peter's looking over at John like, dude, is he just rubbing it in now? Like, what's the point? So the Bible says that John looks up and realizes at that moment it's Jesus. Now, before he realizes, the guy that stayed on the shore asked him if there's any fish. Before they realize it's him, he says, throw your net on the other side. Can I just say to you, that's like fishing all day and pulling your boat up on the shore and the guy getting ready to go said, oh man, you should have been using a spinner bait today. I thought about this years ago. I actually preached a sermon in Africa one time. I think in that instant, even though they didn't know it was Jesus, I think Peter went, wait a second, I've heard that before. Because if you know the whole story about Peter's life, you know that when Jesus really, really called him to follow him, it was on a boat. And Peter and them had fished all night and Jesus gets on his boat and he says, push a little off the shore. And Jesus teaches on the boat, but when he's done teaching, he says, hey, throw your net out again. He said, master, we've been fishing all night. 
This is what we do. This is not what you do. We've been, we've been fishing all night. We ain't caught nothing. And Jesus says, throw it out. And he says, because you say so, I'll throw it out. So Peter throws the net out and it's so much fish that just one boat can't haul it. And so two boats have to come together and they pull it in on shore. So years later, after all the defeat, after all the upset, after all the chaos and, and confusion, Peter's now on a boat in the same scenario after fished all night, not caught anything. He hears a strange voice out on the shore and he says, throw it on the other side. And I can only imagine Peter went, whatever, man, it worked last time. I'll throw it out again. They throw it out. It says they pull in so much that they can't pull it up onto the boat. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen fishing boats like this, but I've been in fishing boats like this. And, and the goal is not to drag the net. The goal is to get the net up in the boat so the fish are secure in the boat. But there were so many fish in the net that they couldn't put the net in the boat. That's a large amount of fish. That's a, yeah, good day. So the Bible says that John looks up the one Jesus loved. Don't you like that the writer describes himself as the one Jesus loved? Anyway. Just saying, the one Jesus loved. He says, Peter, that's, that's him. That's Jesus. Peter doesn't hesitate. He says he throws his outer garment on, he had taken it off. I can be soaking wet, but not improper. Throws his outer garment off, jumps in the water, and, and maybe he can run I don't know how deep it was at a hundred yards out, but maybe he can walk. Maybe he's swimming. Maybe he's doing a combination of both. He's just advancing as fast as he can to the shore. He gets to the shore and he finds out it's Jesus. Jesus has a fire going with some fish on it and some, and just ready for breakfast. And he says, Hey man, you got any more fish? Now I know how I get in those circumstances. So I imagine Peter's just overwhelmed, unbelievable. And, and it, it records that Jesus or Peter goes back to the boat to grab more, f to pull the fish up. And so you can imagine, he's like, this is Jesus, but he wants fish and don't, I need to get the fish. Gets a fish. They sit down. They start having a conversation. I believe this is the first time Jesus has really been able to sit down and have a conversation with Peter. The other times that it describes him being with them, there's not really a conversation happening. Jesus is revealing himself to him and he's saying, hey, I'm alive. When they're in the house, doesn't really record a giant conversation. When he comes in the second time in the house, it's for Thomas's benefit to like, hey, touch me, I'm real. So it doesn't really record a bunch of conversations. So this time he's sitting down with them eating. Looks over at Peter and he says this, do you love me? Peter says, you know, I love you. Now, you know, you know, this is like that conversation with a family member that you know you've screwed up bad. And you're just hoping you can sort of get by it without actually having the conversation. Any married couples ever done that? Just walk in the room, you're like, we good? We good, all right. I mean, we don't gotta talk about this. So you can imagine the anxiety that had built in Peter's stomach as he began to sit down and realize he's sitting beside the one now who he denied. I mean, we're talking about, we're, we're talking about Judas did sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. Peter, you could make the argument, sold him out for nothing. I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. And now you can imagine Peter sitting beside now resurrected son of God and you can feel the angst in him in the moment. And then Jesus looks over at him and goes, we're still good, you love me? Peter says, you know I love you. Take care of my sheep. And then he asks him again, I don't know if there was a conversation in the middle of that. I don't know how it went. But Jesus turns back to him at some point in time again and says, hey, do you love me? Peter says, you know I love you. Take care of my sheep. Feed them. Take care of them. He asks him the third time. And it says Peter is starting to get upset about the conversation. Like, come on. He asked me three times. 
Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. You know I love you. And then Jesus says again, come on. So I want to talk to you this morning, not about Peter, but about Jesus. Because Jesus was shaping Peter, not the opposite way. Jesus was shaping Peter. Peter was not shaping Jesus. We are called to shape people. Amen? Go in all the world. We talked about it. Go in all the world, make disciples of every nation, baptize them in the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And lo, I will be with you always. He's called us to do that. He's called us. He said he would empower us to be witnesses all over the world. So it's our job to shape people into following Christ, just like it was Christ's job to shape people to follow him. So he's passed the baton onto us. So I don't want to look at it from Peter's point of view that the one being shaped, I want to look at it from Jesus, the one shaping Peter. So here's the first thing I want to tell you. Let me back up a second. Everyone in this room would have given up on Peter at some point in time and no one would have blamed you. First point. No one would blame you. There it is. I got him nervous now. No one would blame you. In our modern day world of church, we are, we are negotiating with people now. We're negotiating on, on whether it's worth it. We're negotiating on how much chaos they've caused. We're, we're negotiating on, on did, they, did, did, they, did they do it on purpose? Did, did they, did, or oh, they're sinning on purpose. And so now we can't, they're doing this on purpose. And, 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 they, and they lied about me. And they, and if you use those as a prerequisite for whether we shape people or not, you will have reason probably once a week to walk away and no one will blame you. If Jesus would have looked at Peter at that point in time and said, bro, it was a good ride, but I can't overlook it. No one in this room would say, well, he was being a little harsh with them. Jesus could have said, you're the one who helped get me killed. You were standing right there and could have done something about it, but you kept your mouth shut. Not only did you keep your mouth shut, but you denied knowing me. I'm not sure our future is going to be great together. I'm not sure that we can keep doing this. I'm not sure I can trust you anymore. I'm not sure. And no one would have blamed Jesus for that. Because it's rational. It seems right. And so what we do in the modern day church is we kind of keep a scoreboard of people's success and their failures. And when one outweighs the other, we make the decision. Amen. And then I was reminded of a wedding I did recently. First Corinthians 13, love keeps no record of good. <laughs> That's what it seems like sometimes, doesn't it? No, it's that love keeps no record of what? Wrongs. How many times should we forgive somebody? We talked about that. As many times as it takes. But what we've done is we've created a circumstance where you can back away from shaping people because of their record and no one will blame you. Because after all, I ain't got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. Jesus did the exact opposite though. Peter, in his worst failure recorded in scripture, Jesus had every right to push him away, had every right not to trust him with the gospel going forward, had every right not to give him a leadership position, had every right to make him go on a three-year sabbatical to get things straight. And nobody would have blamed him. But Jesus did the exact opposite. He leaned into Peter. He leaned, leaned into Peter. He was, he was willing to even have a conversation. He was willing to sit down with him and say, hey man, do you still love me? Yeah, I love you. Do you are you sure you still love me? Yes, I love you. Do you still love me? Yes. Let 
I want to say this to you. The reason for us staying in relationships with people should never be because of what they've done to you, but what Christ has done for you. <clears throat> I'm getting that looked at. Here's what happens. I'm gauging every one of my relationships according to how you treat me, not how Christ treated me. Oh, now you're gonna have to go home and be nice to your wife. Sorry about that. What happens is, is we gauge the future of all our relationships on the basis of how are you currently treating me? When Jesus didn't, didn't do that to people, Jesus saw something different in people and then, and then never gauged it according to how Peter was treating him, but by how he was supposed to shape Peter. Because you know what the ridiculous thing is? The ridiculous thing about relationships, it's like me and my kids. If my kid is 16 years old and they're smarting off to me, I don't write them off. Because they're acting as someone who has not been shaped yet. <laughs> we call it natural in the Jones house. They're acting like they naturally would. So it's the father's responsibility to now shape them <laughs> into something productive for society. So the reason I'm leaning into their relationship is not because of what they've done to me, but because what Christ has done through me. So he has given me the ability to forgive the people that are around me. He's given me the ability to not overlook it, but take it into consideration as part of the shaping. He's given me the ability to stay in it even when I'm not treat, treated like I should be treated. Because Jesus stayed in it even though he was treated like he shouldn't have been treated. So it's fascinating to me that the reason we get out of relationships is not because of how we treat people, but because of how people treat us. I think that's a bad motivation to leave a relationship. Well, they're treating me like dirt. Okay, they don't know any better. Mm. So it's like taking, telling a three-year-old, hey, you shouldn't cry at the dinner table. Really, you should not cry at the dinner table. But they keep crying, so you say, I'm done with you. Now the issue is they don't know anything different. So when you shape them and they're 21 and they're crying at the dinner table, then, then you're still patient and you're still saying, come on kid, stop being a kid. So watch this. We need people who can't be run off shaping people. Did you hear that? We need people who cannot be run off, shaping people. Well, here's what I've realized about Jesus. You couldn't run him off. You couldn't run him off. You couldn't offend him to the point where he wouldn't come back to you. You couldn't run him off. It's unbelievable. And here's what I know about people today. We are easily offended. Wow. Even in the church world. Well, I don't like the shirt you're wearing. Oh, well, I'm, pastor, I'm not sure I can do this anymore. <laughs> they told me I was standing on the wrong side of the door. Because you are. Let's just clear that up. You're standing on the wrong side. So now let them shape you into standing on the right side. So the issue is, the issue is if we're going to shape people, we have to be committed to the relationship. Amen? So we need to be a church that is not easily offended. We need to be a church that's not easily run off. Be a church that's engaged in relationships. I've been saying lately, we're not a church that gives up on relationships quickly. It's gonna be hard to quit us. It's gonna be hard. We already got your address. We got your phone number. You ain't never seen spam like we can put out. <laughs> Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming. Yes. You walked in the first time, you're like, babe, I think this is a cult. I think we need to roll out. Like, I don't know what's happening here. The second thing, what you see in them has to be greater than the cost of pursuing them. 
In, in our world of investment and return and ROI, return on investment, all that stuff, we want to have the least amount of, in, least amount of input to, for the greatest amount of output. That's any smart investor will tell you. I want to put the, I want to find the fund that I can put the least amount of money in and get the most return. So we gauge relationships like that. How much am I putting in versus how much am I getting out of it? So that's why we start out marriage thinking 50, 50, because I definitely don't want to put in any more than she is. But when you realize that if you're going to stay married for a long time, your investment is typically at times more than what you're getting back. Somebody say amen. amen. So what happens if you always gauge relationships on an ROI scale of what am I investing versus what I'm getting back, you'll give up on everybody sooner or later. So Jesus didn't, didn't, everything he saw in Peter was worth more than what he was putting out for Peter at the time. And we have to realize that. Only the crazy thing is you don't get the same benefit that Jesus had. You can't see into the future. So what we do is we take a snapshot of people and we proclaim their whole future on that snapshot. And we say, they screwed it up here, they'll never make anything of themselves. Well, they really messed this up, there's no more chance for them. Well, this is as bad as it could get, I don't see how this works out. In Matthew, Jesus says this, Matthew chapter 16, starts in verse 16. Jesus asks the disciples a question, he says, hey, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some say you're this, some say you're that, some say you're this. And he says, who do you say that I am? Who do you think I am? Peter stands up. Verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. I mean, that's his blunt and direct as you are it. You're the one God sent. We believe that. Watch Jesus answer. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Jesus looks at Peter and says, I'm going to start the whole thing with you. I'm going to start the whole thing with you. And then Peter screws the whole thing up. And we're reading where Jesus leaned back into Peter because the game plan was still the same game plan. Is it possible that the calling of God on the person, on the person sitting right beside you might have already factored in them screwing up? Is it possible that the calling of God on the person sitting right beside you might have already factored in them taking three years and doing nothing with their life. And you being the most frustrated person on the planet going, God, what are you doing? And God says, I've already worked it in. It's baked in the cake. I knew Peter was going to deny me before I ever said it to him. And I said it anyway. So what we do is we're situational people where we're like, oh, well, looks like, looks like God we used to say it in the old school church like this. Well, they backslid. Anybody remember that? You could have come to a prayer meeting for 40 years and watched a movie. Looks like they're backslidden. You know what? Here's the thing. I think God put a calling on my life and baked in me not listening sometimes. He already knew I wasn't going to listen sometimes. He already knew I was going to sin. If God was worried about all that, he would have never called me in the beginning. But his grace is sufficient for everything that I'm going to walk through. So God is not naive to what you're capable of or what you will do. But he knows his grace is enough to see you through all of that stuff and more. So when he looks at Peter and he says, on this rock, I will build my church. He didn't look at everybody else and go, yeah, he's going to screw it up before he gets there. No, he said, on this rock, I will build my church and what you bound in earth will be bound in heaven. What you lose, I'll give you authority over things. And then Peter walks right in front of everybody and goes, I don't know him. I don't know him. Now we're at Jesus leaning back into him because Jesus knows what he called out of him way back then was still at work in his life. And so when we're ready to give up because we look at the ROI and we say, man, what I'm putting into this, I'm not getting anything out. We need to realize that the calling that God put on people is always worth it. And maybe, 
Thank you. One person. Talk about a return. Listen, listen. What if you were called to shape the downturn? I didn't give that to the first service, so you're getting lucky here. What if it was your calling to shape the downturn? Come on, some of you know economics, you know it goes up, what goes up comes down, what goes up comes down, what goes up comes, it just goes like this all the time, all the time, all the time. And the myth that we have put in our heads is that God has always called us to people who are successful and always called us to people who are making it and always called us to people who've got it together. But what if his calling on your life is to shape somebody on the down? Because here's what I know. <laughs> the best time to buy stocks is when nobody's buying stocks. The best time to buy is when everybody's selling. So you look around your family and the person everybody's writing off, lean in. You look at your job and that person everybody's writing off, Jesus would say, all right, it's time to lean in. I called you to shape the downturn. I didn't call you just be around people when they're successful and make you look good and, and give you back what you give them. No, I called you as a church to wrap your arms around the broken and downtrodden, the people that have no hope. When Peter had no hope and said, what are you going to do today? I don't know, I'm going fishing. Jesus was on the shore waiting on him to get done, an unsuccessful day. And when he walked up there, he said, hey, you're still the man. Still the man. I'm here to shape you when you're down, not just when you're up. Because I'm going to tell you something. It's actually easier to shape people when they're down because they're not as cocky. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, it'd be helpful if you weren't as cocky. <laughs> we got to trust God's plan for the people that were around, just like we're trusting it for us. If God saved them, he's called them. One doesn't come without the other. God didn't save anybody just like, how'd you get here? Well, I got saved. What'd you do after that? Nothing. Just waited on heaven. It's no such thing. If you're saved, he's called you. Can I say that again? If, he's, if you're saved, he's called you. You need to be confident that he's called you to shape somebody. All right, the band's going to come. I've been having too much fun this morning. Lead them. Don't make them chase you. Lead them, don't make them chase you. You know, it's different between just running in front of people and leading people. It's two different things there. You can run in front of people and just yell back and say, keep up, keep up, you better keep up. We're going somewhere, you better keep up. Or you can lead people to where God has called them to be. It looks totally different. Jesus did not dial up Peter and say, hey man, I forgot that you denied me and I want to have a conversation about it. You're going to meet on my terms in my place when I'm ready. And when I feel like forgiving you, I'll let you know. That's making people chase you. Jesus shows up where Peter's going to be. <laughs> How many times in my life where I thought, man, this is, I'm not the guy for this. I'm, I shouldn't be. And this isn't just humble for a sermon. Like, I didn't get here the way people typically get here. And, and it, was a, it was a life of hard knocks. I happened to have a great pastor who would lean into me and lean into me and lean into me. And I, I'm going to tell you something. Talk about shaping a downturn. Just keep leaning in. And what happens... What happens when, you're, when you don't have the pedigree to do what you do, you don't, you don't have all the qualifications that, that people say you should have, then, then you know how big it is when somebody above you shows up where you are? That I didn't have to chase them? That they were like, no, 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 we see something in you and we'll come to you says so much. Jesus put value on Peter by showing up where Peter was, not making Peter chase him. 
So if you got a kid off the rails, just show up where they are one day. If you got a, if you got, if you got a, a friendship off the rails, don't make them chase you. Show up where they are one day. I can see Peter standing in the boat going, I can't believe he's here. church world of efficiency and all this stuff where we where we can only meet people in certain hours of the day and we we've got to schedule it all out to be successful and all these things we quit showing up where people are hurting we quit showing up when they're when they're when they're in a place where they don't know where to go we quit showing up because we're like hey we're successful come chase us do what we're doing and then you'll be better off sometimes people just need us to show up and say I still believe in you Stand your feet. Here's the last thing. Keep the call in front of them. Keep the call in front of them. Keep the, I don't care what they did. Keep the call in front of them. After Jesus' whole conversation with him, the last thing he says to them is this. Follow me. Follow me. It didn't change. He didn't say, follow me and then we're going to have this thing you got to do to make sure I can trust you all the way back years before on the boat looking at Peter, James and John and these guys follow me. What is it after he screws up? Follow me. Follow me. He kept the vision right in front of him. Kept the calling right in front of him. What is it now? Follow me. It hasn't changed. Follow me. Follow me. And the guy who denies Jesus just a little bit while later is empowered by the Holy Spirit, stands up in front of the people who crucified Jesus and says, this is the son of God. This is the one God sent. And 3,000 people come to know Christ. You know why? Because Jesus didn't give up even though he had the right to. It's because he valued what he put in him more than the pursuit. And he, and he kept the call in front of him. He just said, do what you're supposed to. Come on, follow me. Just keep doing it. Father, we pray this morning, Lord, that we'd be a church that's hard to quit. Lord, that we'd be, the relationships we're in, Lord, we just keep leaning in with patience and with persistence. Just keep leaning in, leaning in, leaning in, knowing, God, that you, at the end of the day, are going to receive glory. Lord, that you have called us to people to shape them and the followers of you. And we pray through every season of their life, they'd have one consistent thing. The church never quit them. That they can believe in a God who sent people to them to never quit. Lord, we pray today that we would, you put power in us to stay, power in us to be patient and power in us to be persistent. And we pray this community would change because of it. We pray that our families would change because of it. We pray that our employee and places of employment would change because of it. Because you can't run us off. We're here for the duration. Thank you for that power that you so freely give us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen and amen. Come on, give him praise and honor this morning. It's good. Be persistent with somebody this week and patient. We'll see you back here next week.